Good afternoon. Welcome to today's SCA webinar with Dr. Salim Shaker on geopressure for exploration success from the source to the wellhead. Before we start today's webinar, we'd like to ask a few questions about the demographics of the audience today. So I'm going to share with you some polling questions. And the first question is, what is your primary discipline? So you should see that question on the screen. It looks like we have some geoscientists in the crowd, um, a few petrophysicists. We're still getting answers coming in. A few more voting. We've got some petroleum engineers. So the majority of you have voted, so I'll share the responses. We have 80% geoscientists, 10% petroleum engineers, 10% petrophysicists. And our next polling question is, how many years of full-time experience do you have in the upstream oil and gas industry? Quite a few with over 30 years experience and quite a few in the middle range, 11 to 20 years. Still getting some answers. Looks like uh, we're still getting some responses. Most of you have voted, so I'll go ahead and share the results. It looks like we have 40% over 30 years, 40% in the 11 to 20 years, and 20% in the 21 to 30 years. So sort of a bimodal distribution there. So uh, before I introduce Salim, I'd like to remind the audience today that you are muted. So if you want to ask questions, you can use the uh, go to webinar question feature to ask your questions and we'll cover the Q&A at the end of the presentation. You will be anonymous. So, uh, Today's presentation with SCA is Dr. Salim Shaker. He'll be talking about geopressure for exploration success from the source to the wellhead. And Dr. Shaker is a consultant for geo, analysis, geo pressure analysis services. He has multiple degrees through a PhD in geology uh, from ASU in Egypt and has also received diplomas uh, from Prague University. He started his career in Egypt and over 30 years plus, he has uh, worked as a exploration geologist with prospects around the world. He's published over 40 papers uh, on the topic of geopressure. So he's certainly a subject matter expert in that topic. And he teaches short courses in uh, geopressure to multiple professional societies and also for in-house clients. He was the chair of the poor pressure session for APG 2014 and chaired the APG Deepwater Geoscience Workshops from 2010 to 2016. He won the Gordon Atwater Award um, from Gulf Coast Society Association of Geoscience 2015 for a paper he wrote on poor pressure prediction. Dr. Shaker teaches these courses for SCA, poor pressure, fracture, pressure, and well bore stability, for safe drilling, formation, fracture, pressure interpretation analysis, and seal and reservoir pressures, analysis for ENP prospects and risk assessment. So the course that uh, Salim will be mentioning today is offered live online uh, November 2nd through 4th and 9th through 11th. This is a new virtual format that we're offering in the mornings in North America time. And this course uh, covers, of course, poor pressure, fracture pressure, and well bore stability. And you can see the learning outcomes mentioned there. Um, this course is also available for being taught in-house. So if you would like it to be taught either virtually or in person, at your own location, please contact us uh, because we can make sure that that's available for you. And this is one of the series of SCA webinars that we're offering, uh, uh, usually featuring our instructors, instructors. And the next one is scheduled, scheduled for October 14th. Bill Krebs will be teaching and talking about biostratigraphy in offshore Myanmar. And of course, turn to SCA for all your talent needs regarding consulting, direct hire, projects, and studies, 
and technical training. And so I'm going to pass the presentation rights to you, Salim, and ask you to start your presentation. Thank you, Susan, for that nice introduction. And uh, I would thank everybody uh, have the eagerness to attend this class or this uh, short presentation. I will put my PowerPoint presentation up and hopefully everybody hear me. Yes, we can hear you and we can see your slides. Very good. Thank you so much. Thanks. Now, frequently dry holes the result of a breach reservoir or blown up seal. That's what we hear all the time. Poor pressure prediction and geopressure analysis can help the industry to increase success. This is all about this 40 minutes I'm gonna give you, but all the details is gonna be in the course. So we'll go from here to the learning outcome. And you can see this on the SCA website in details, the causes of pressure, impact of geopressure, and the FE, the geology, the physics, the tolerance window, drilling tolerance window, and case history of success versus failure and we blame the due pressure on the success and the failure, but we blame it on the failure rather than the success. And then testing and assessment. On this slide, I do think that pressure and temperature Pressure and temperature here are responsible for the generation of hydrocarbon here. Do you see that pointer? And the yes, migration the of, okay, good. The migration through the deep seated source rock, going to the carrier bed, that's easy. The carrier bed is just open channel, it's mainly sandstone. And then the hydrocarbon stop here, You're gonna hit the fall, the fault, and the pressure has to increase to a point where the fault act like a faulty seal. Open and close, open and close, and then go to another level until you get to the trap. This is two processes, right? This is the geological process, and we have nothing to do with it. And then reach the trap and the man-made process. Uh, the two processes is involved, the due pressure involved in it. The viable prospect, how can I get a viable prospect? We risk each prospect based on the hydrocarbon source, where is it, and the reservoir. We need a reservoir to receive the hydrocarbon, contain it for 10 or 15 million years until we drill to that reservoir and the reservoir will deliver the hydrocarbon. Sometimes the reservoir would do, for some reason, this is a geology, pure geology, doesn't want to deliver the hydrocarbon, we have to frack it. And now we have to have a seal for that reservoir. And that prospect or the seal has to be drillable. You don't give me a 50,000 feet borehole, I want to drill it. I need something drillable. Now in the unconventional resources down here, we got confused between reservoirs and seeds, which is which. But anyway, I'm going to leave this to the expert. There is something we call it the expiration fairway. We see the type of rocks at certain level, 
and you can see it here where is the sand or the porous material this is the reservoir and this is the seal on the top layer here when the reservoir and the seal they meet the requirement of a good prospect we choose a prospect here you see four prospects here one two three four two of them on the downthrown side of a four i don't like the downthrown side of the four most of the industry they don't like the downtime of the four here is four-way closure here is upthrown closure so to reduce the risk we're going to take the four-way closure and we go to the exploration manager or the vp we said well that's what we have we have four-way closure here and the geophysicists say there are a flat spot here right here and you have a hydrocarbon indicator there so this is a good indication of the presence of hydrocarbon okay now the engineers come with the proposed location get that proposed location and we look at something else money the gng we spend already gone but most of the drilling costs is gonna take some of that budget for that prospect so you got the casing, mud program, conductor, a riser in deep water, well head, and the blue out preventer. We know, we know how important that baby is. And the perforation and the formation test. These is the items will take a lot of money to do. And these items depends on the dew pressure profile. How the dew pressure profile in the subsurface. What is the cause of the dew pressure? Okay, is the fighting between the fluid and the pores? That's what they call pore and the rock mechanics. Pores full of water, fluid, and rock mechanics is the grain. How the grain behave? The rock mechanics. Look at it. You got the overburden here. You got the minimum stress, intermediate stress. And you might have a tectonic here. So they, you got four victories, this victory. They're fighting and the fluid is not happy. So the, fly, the fluid fight back. That's why you have poor pressure. And how many fluids do we have in the subsurface when we drill wells? Okay? That's the main fluid. 99.9 .9. but we're looking for oil and gas for those two minor fluids and we use the drilling fluid to the drilling mud to drill the borehole all of them they have a different density the four of them so when we plot them here they give you that pressure plot that's the pressure plot we use a lot of time that's that's the, the, the previous slide was the fluid this is the rocks the vertical stress we refer to as the overburden or the principal stress same thing here intermediate and the minimum so we come up with a plot we've been using it for about 90 years since we discovered oil here in Pennsylvania and uh, you get the three fluids here and then you got the mud fan you call it the mud fan and we use the horizontal stress at the horizontal axis to the pressure vertical axis to the depth that plot sometimes is responsible for a lot of pitfalls and we'll talk about it later in the course the fundamental of subsurface pressure is porosity right here, impermeable or low porosity here, and the fluid, the water, hydrostatic, and the principal stress, the rocks. All of them, they're gonna act against each other and they give me a profile. That profile, that pressure profile in the shale, 
it does behave exponentially. We see it here. On the other hand, in the sand, it does behave linear. Now, there another pressure or uh, uh, another item goes in the frac pressure, which is the dashed line between the pool pressure and the frac pressure. There is a window. I call it the drilling tolerance window. Let's call it the window from now on. So we design the mud to go between the pool pressure and the frac pressure. However, because the pool pressure is not a continuous line is split between the shale and the sand here. We have a little problem here when the sand pressure way higher than the shale pressure, we got a kick here. On the other hand, when the sand less than the shale, we got a loss of circulation. Also, we have the safety limits. The safety limits is here in the US and the Gulf of Mexico is about between quarter pound to a half a pound less than the frac pressure. So all these items get together and try to figure out why we have the difference or the disparity between the measure and the predicted pool pressure in the shale. The several causes for the disparity between the shale and the sand. But I gotta mention one of them right here. Just an example. Okay, and here we have a deposit, sand, sand encased in shale here. And we are going to propose a well to drill here because we see something worse, exploration down here. And we have two and four, they are in communication. Three is not, this one encased. We're gonna get the velocity from the surface, drop the velocity on our software or our uh, spreadsheet, predict the pool pressure. We will predict the pool pressure in the shape right here. It's a predicted pool pressure, not in the sand. The sand, okay, we design our mud weight based on the pool pressure prediction in the shale. The sand comes later. You see this guys in communication, two and four. They're gonna sit in the same envelope. Three is sealed, is not in communication with those two guys. So it's gonna have a different envelope. Here's the kick, here's a loss of circulation. And let's be honest, most of the drilling problems take place between the, the seal and the reservoir. In the class, we're gonna go from the known to the unknown. We're gonna go from the measurements of pool pressure to the prediction. So the measurement is gonna take about maybe a day, and then the prediction is going to take about another day. So we're going to go from modeling to calibration to assessment. The modeling, it depends on the regional geology, the geological building blocks. That's where we're going to get to the lead, how we came to this prospect and why we tried to drill this prospect. And then we're going to look at the offset data, the regional Top, geo pressure top is very important. Based on the geo pressure top, you can see if you have a seal or not seal, or where you're gonna put your intermediate casing, and you're gonna go beyond, and then we're gonna do a pressure basin modeling also. We're gonna learn from the seismic velocity, enter seismic velocity, pre-stack on the prospect how we will design a pool pressure profile that at the end give us casing point, 
bad programs and where we expect some challenges when we drill the well. Because if we cannot drill the well, we don't have a prospect. We don't have any success. This is how the velocity looks like. The velocity converted to poor pressure right there, that dashed black line. We give a quarter of a pound or half a pound, it depends on where you are in the section, to have the low bound of the month. That's the low bound of the month. We give it half a pound to a pound, that's the upper, upper bound of the month. If you have kicks or gas or something coming in the borehole, you're going to increase your mud between half and a pound. Here is a frac pressure, the green dashed line. That's from the velocity also. The frac pressure, you cannot drill or use mud until you reach the frac pressure. If you do, you're going to lose the mud in the borehole, and then you're going to have a very strong kick. So our design, get two designs, one without any troubles, that black arrows, that's what the first casing point, second casing point, third casing point. But if we receive gas kicks and challenges during the borehole, Maybe we need four casing points. Yeah. So we send the, the guy to get more casing points. So if we know in advance, we're going to have a challenging borehole. We're going to prepare to that in advance. You're going to stack your casing on the drag, on the rig floor without uh, rushing to and wait and lose time. While drilling, all these guys here, ROP, gas, this is my favorite, shut impression. And from the mud log, the ACD, ESD, ECD, mud cut. This is very important. And uh, the chlorides, MWD, LOT for the fracture, our DFT. A DFT has been used recently, which is uh, measuring the formation while drilling. But sometimes it causes little troubles because when you measure, you're stuck in the hole sometimes. They're a common pitfall for poor pressure calibration. I do predict the poor pressure here from the shear. All right. And then I come to the pay zone here. That's the pay zone. Take the RFTs and try to jive that predicted pool pressure to the measured pool pressure. It's not going to work because you're going to end up with four pounds over. Not four, I'm sorry, not four pounds, 1,500 PSI predicted over the actual. The best way to do it is shut in pressure. So we're going to go through that calibrations and the pitfalls of calibrating the predicted pool pressure. We're not calibrating the measured pool pressure. We calibrate the predicted pool pressure. We calibrate the pre-drilling model, which is came from the seismic. There are a few case, case, a lot of case histories in the course, but I'm going to give you a couple of them here. Okay, just a flavor or taste in the salt basin and in the deep water. Why the deep water need more casing and than the shallow water? Because we have two pressure plots here. Yeah? And we're going to reach, we need to drill two wells, one in the shallow water, one in the deep water, to 20,000 feet. The deep water here, this mud line at 7,000 feet. What is going to happen here? The rocks is going to move down 7,000 feet to the mud line. This is water. 
This is not rocks. Over here is all rocks. So what happened here? The pore pressure is gonna move 7,000 feet also. And instead of here, it's gonna move down here. The frat pressure also is gonna move the same way. So we're gonna end up with, we're gonna reach at the same time, the 20,000 feet. But here in the deep water, here is in the shallow water. We end up with a drilling window. Here is wider, here is narrow window. So to reach the 20,000 feet here, we need three casing points. On the other hand, here to reach the 20,000 feet, we need four casing points. That's why the deep water is costly and the window, the drilling window is very sensitive. You know, you cannot maneuver easy. If you have a gas kick, you have to right there. You have to be alert and treat the problem quickly. Uh, that's another example of how the sequence stratigraphy help evaluate or assess your risk also. This is the Ogre Basin in offshore Texas. Uh, this example uh, okay, is about 10 years ago. We have four fields here. Producing fields. If I take a seismic line from this going west to block 600, from 602 to 600, let's see what the seismic line looks like. I mean, here is the seismic line looks like. Here is the field. And our target is higher than the field, way higher than the field. And they bet on this block 40 million years ago. Uh, 40, sorry, 40 million, 40 million dollar. That's about 15 years ago. They drill it, it's a dry hole. I mean, wet. Nice sand, beautiful. No problem for the reservoir. The only problem is was the breach reservoir. If you look at this, a salt ridge, which is the salt was growing during the sedimentation. Over here, the salt came way past the sedimentation. So this part of the basin was a basin, and that was high. So as inverted system. So the sequence stratigraphy, look at it and it justify if that, I mean, the soul history can justify if this is a pierce or a ridge. That's the two pressure plots. You see the dry hole, it just, the, the poor pressure never gain any traction when just hydrostatic all the way. On the other hand, the producer, the poor pressure start to increase, start to kick. The gas start coming out and the resistivity on the sonic start to increase and shift it. And we have a little Gas kicks, little problems here or challenges. And this is the producer. This is RFTs. Believe me, if you will, goes quietly from the top to the bottom, that's bad news. You need to receive some kicks, some action coming from the borehole. The whole borehole has to breathe. If the borehole does not breathe, eh. but anyway. That's not in general, this is most of the cases. The salt, salt sediment stress models. Okay, this is our core, rock core. You got the principal, intermediate, minimum. And average density is gram cc, 2.2 gram cc. 
We're going to take that core. What are we going to do? We're going to put salt underneath that core. Let's look at it. Here is the overburden or the weight of the sediment. And here the buoyancy of the soul. Why? Because the soul is 1.9. You got 0.3 gram cc difference. So this core will be more compressed than this core. On the other hand, this core is going to lose the stress because the buoyancy of the soul. There's a lot of models, a lot of justification for that. Yeah, we're going to see that on the course in detail. This is if you have a, a soul trend. We have in the, me and SCA, we have seven models for the salt sediments or salt basin sediment, sediment interaction, salt sediment interaction, seven models. I'm gonna just show you a little taste of the dirty and the clean salt. By the way, I came up with the dirty term long time ago, maybe 12, 12 years ago when they drilled Jack. Here is Jack. It's a very salt toe. And you see the salt is pushing that way, right here. And push the sediments up. So the side stress became the principal stress. The overbird and the, the weight of the sediments became the minimum. And here is the model, you can see it here. Weight of the sediments, folding, intermediate, and the principal is just going that way, it's a tectonic, it's not a weight. However, oh, this is this what happened, okay? The sediments sitting here, mind on their own business a line. This is a real picture, by the way. And the Siberian tiger came out of the cage and tackled him. That's what Siberian tiger, that's the soul. And this is the lion. The sediments was mind their own business, no problem. But they got wrinkled and folded and all kind of traps has been formed here. So let's see what, here is the Wilcox, this is Jack. The Wilcox sitting for 80 million years, no problem in a deep environment. So hydrostatic, principal stress, poor pressure way deep, this is the top of the geo pressure, no problem. And the soul, charge in, is like a Siberian tiger. Walking in, down dip, bringing with the after block. And plowing the base of the sediments right here at the the the, the sea floor. So it caused a gouge or zone, a rubble zone, and carry rafted blocks. And instead of salt, it is sediments. So what's happened here? Okay, the old sediments here is form a new trap form a new shape, and the poor pressure is going to leave the bottom, go to the top. And you see that the stress over here is a little higher, and here is lower. Because here that the buoyancy of the soul make the stress higher on the top here, and the buoyancy of the salt make the stress lower below the salt. This is applied not just in the salt, salt toe. This is applied in the overhangs, salt sheets. Uh, the pull pressure. The pull pressure is going to go, instead of down here, it's going to go up here at the top of the geo pressure. And the borehole is going to penetrate. But instead of penetrating the salt, it's going to create some sediments beside the salt. The pore pressure on the salt is zero. 
There's no fluid in it, no porosity. But the presence of the grafted sediments, it kicks, give kicks. So the mud, the the uh, the mud flow guys, they try to compensate and raise the mud weight. Here is the dangerous zone where you have the rubble and you have the less stress. So you got rubble zone, you got reduction in the stress. That's what is going to happen. What? Let's see that. Let, let, let's see what happened between Jack and Mellow. The case I like, I talking about the model I was talking about. This is the model of Jack. Jack and Mala is 15 miles apart. Here's Jack. That's the principal stress here, the, 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 the overburden from the density log is a calculated frag pressure from the LOT is the casing point. What happened here when we drill in the dirty soil? Where sediments, sediments included in the soil, our pore pressure goes up, and the mud weight follow suit, and you get to the point at the gauge zone, the mud weight and the frag pressure they meet, and then you're gonna have complete loss of circulation. Malo, which is 15 miles apart. It doesn't have a dead soil. It has a clean soil. So the drilling terrace window was wide. No problem. They went through it. They had you didn't have casing under the soil. You just went through it until they reached the depths of the casing and they did it because it has a wide drilling tolerance uh, window. You see the difference here. Here is the mud. Here is the mud. The mud went straight. No, because it doesn't need to increase the mud. You got a clean soil. I need to speed it up. The same thing was Atlantis versus Hadrian discoveries. This is from BP, drilled by BP. They have a lot of problem challenges here at the, the Gauss zone or the bottom of the soil. Here you have a nice wide drilling terrace window in Hadrian. No problem. The claim is you can see the dairy salt in the size. Sometimes I see it, sometimes I don't. So try it and look at some areas if you have a lot of size. The borehole stability, okay, you go between a gauge to hole where it's safe mud weight, go between the safe pressure gradient to the frag pressure gradient. This is a gauge door, no problem. If you have underbalance, you start seeing breakout. You can see it on the shale shaker. You can see the sloughing shale coming out. If the underbalance or nobody pay attention to the mud weight, you're gonna have a collapse hole and back off borehole. On the other hand, if you have overbalance, you can have ballooning, mud loss in the shale. Ballooning takes place, place in the shale. If the overbalance really become, become excessive, you're going to have a damaged borehole. Uh, this is, we're going to go through this in the course in details. Post drilling assessment, this is one of the interesting part of this course because you can drill a dry hole, but it's, you do not condemn the whole area or the whole prospect because you have just one dry hole. From that dry hole, you can get, looking at the pressure plots, the where your uh, main target, the second target, you can generate another target based on your pressure plots. And you can draw another one. This is uh, the pressure surge and the hydrocarbon pay zones from, if you look at the RFTs here, 
what did it tell you? It tell you you have about 2,000 PSI excess pressure. That 2,000 PSI excess pressure, the, the reservoir engineers know that, is going to make that reservoir produce for over 20 years. No problem. But if your excess pressure is here, near by the hydrostatic, maybe you're going to produce for three, four years, and then your pressure will drop. So take it down. MDT or RFT also give you a good hint on the compartmentalization, density of the hydrocarbon, and safety when you're going to drill up and down. We came up with uh, four zones, pressure zones instead of two. Uh, if you look at the pressure and the pressure in the red dashed lines here, you look at the velocity here. The velocity in the shallow zone does not change. This is the only part of the section is hydrostatic. Now, the pressure increased gradually, exponentially, so that the, 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 uh, the velocity. And then the velocity, instead of increasing, is going to reverse itself and the pressure suddenly take a big jump and then you go back to the other compartmentalization so that's 15 million years that's 10 million years 5 million years this is now so if you tie the geological evolution of the subsurface with what you see in the petrophysical properties with a circumfection trend not normal compaction trend because nothing normal about this zone. This zone has a hydrodynamic push, try to expel the fluid out. So we came up with the four zones. This is compaction equilibrium, this is disequilibrium. Equilibrium means you add stress, you push the fluid out, expel the fluid out. On the other hand, this side is disequilibrium, you push Stress, no fluid coming out. And this is an example in the Gulf of Mexico. Normal A, B is the hydrodynamic or dehydration zone. Transition is C, and the geo pressure is D. And this is the values you're going to use to predict your pressure on your software and your spreadsheet. In the past, okay, was two zones, normal and abnormal. Now we have normal, the shallow one, hydrodynamic or dehydration, the exponential part of the section where the compaction take place and the fluid leave. Over here, C is the transition. That's what everything is stop. The fluid is stop here and build up the pore pressure. Remember my, my second or third slide where the fluid fight the rocks, that's what the pressure comes from. You have to have the seal. I pull a, that slide from Tange in East Asia, the same thing apply, here is A, here is a compaction, here is C when the density reserve uh, reverse self density, not velocity, and this is the geopressure system. And here's the new method. This has been published and you can see the details in the uh, TSO last year. See four zones. One, two, three, four. This is just using that new method, the four zones method. If I use the normal compaction trend, the so-called normal compaction trend, the old traditional way, we're going to see under pressure zones. Watch these zones here. I'm going to show you an example. Under pressure is like a, you have a big air pocket in the subsurface. Okay, this is uh, the calibration during the drilling. Uh, LWD, the compaction trend is going to come like that. We're going to learn how to do this. Here is the effective stress. Here is your 
pay zones, and we're gonna calibrate the red part, which is that the predicted pool pressure in zone C and D by using the SIP, the shot and pressure, not by using the RFTs. Because RFTs is in the sand, the shield is not equal, the pool pressure in the shield is not equal to the pool pressure in the sand. If it is equal, if the pool pressure in the shield equal to the pool pressure in the sand, we can drill anywhere in the world without any problem because we're not gonna see that shift. The novelty of the four zones, you can read it here, software computation pitfalls, hydrodynamic and four zones, and correctly selected the compaction trend. Prediction and calibration, proven transferability, transferability to the software. I'm showing you some examples why we have the four. Remember what I said, there are no under pressure? See, one of the softwares here has been used to predict that poor pressure. Also, the RFTs right here and right here, the RFTs or the measured pool pressure uh, decrease with depths. They're not supposed to. RFTs, MDTs, any pressure measurements supposed to increase with depths, either in PSI or in PPG. Look at that PPG here. Decrease with depths, not increase. This is the problem I'm trying to. It is the issue of our calibration is, is, is missing something when we use that hybrid plot. The plot I showed to you in an early phase. Also, if we use the unloading regression principle, that's what we see here. You see the mud weight used is about four pounds than the estimated pool pressure. You see the RFTs also take a negative dive. No, RFT is supposed to go that way in PSI or PPG. The benefits, a lot of benefits from taking all the courses for the geologists, prospect, risk, not logging, geophysicist. I see that there are 10 geophysicists in the panel. Velocity, velocity, log interpretation, ABO, MUD, the engineers, AFE, they love that AFE, how to try it, try it AFE, casing and drilling events, safety. And we need to tell the people or the people who use the, the oil and gas. It's not you dig a hole and you come with oil and gas. It's very intricate and dangerous process of finding fuel for daily activities. We need to tell them. Again, unintended pitfalls in PP modeling and calibration cost money and sometimes life. And SCA is the company. I'm sorry I took more than I, five minutes over time, but uh, Susan can uh, wrap this off. I think I'm ready for questions. Absolutely. I want to remind our listeners today that you can post your questions in the GoToWebinar question feature. You will be anonymous. And remember, after attending today's webinar, you'll receive a link to the recording of the webinar. You'll get an evaluation form and a link to register for poor pressure, fracture pressure, and well bore stability which is offered in live online format during the mornings of November 2nd through 4th and 9th through 11th uh, in North America. Uh, Dr. Shaker also teaches additional classes for SCA, including for safe drilling, formation, fracture pressure interpretations and analysis, and seal and reservoir pressure analysis for ENP prospects risks assessment. So, Dr. Schaefer, uh, you mentioned about incorporating some of the findings from the four zones method into software. Can you talk a little bit more about that?
Yes. Here is the four zones. Usually, I did work for a software company 20 years ago, poor pressure company. They call it the KSI. And they know how they do it, write the programs, and bring some the data needed for poor pressure prediction, like the overburden, density, uh, sensitivity, uh, velocity, intervelocity. But very few people understand that this model, you think this. That's, that's the, the holy grail. You just take the model and bring that last file and dump it on the model, and it's going to give you a poor pressure profile. No. You have to defy, define the different zones because you're going to get confused. That's what you're going to get. That's what you're going to get if you use the model, whatever model on the software to define to define your poor pressure on the whole last file that's what you're gonna get you're gonna get this area was under pressure extreme jump under pressure another area was under pressure so that's what they do and to correct this problem they break the okay here we go You see the normal compaction trend right here is breaking. I mean, it's broken here. The three, four pieces. Because this person tried to make the measured pull pressure match the predicted pull pressure. So what you do on the software, you just break that line. And everything move. The curves move right and left. So the four zone, it does make you avoid that problem because you predict each zone by itself this is zone a this is zone b and you can design a program for each zone as long as you understand which zone is which where a is going to stop where b is going to stop from the velocity I'm sure I don't have any velocity. Well, I don't have. Well, I do have a velocity profile here. Right here. Here is your velocity. Velocity is 5,000. Right here is two, 200 uh, milliseconds per foot. This is when you convert it to uh, uh, delta T. And then exponentially goes that way. So this is, this is A. This is the start of zone B. And then when the velocity breaks itself, this is zone C and then zone D. Most of that software companies, they use Eaton to predict the pool pressure. And they supposed to apply this supposed to the Eaton equation or the software where Eaton used supposed to apply in C and D. But this has nothing to do with Eaton. This is a compaction trend right here. It's a hydrodynamic. The flow tries to leave. So that's the advantage of program each zone by itself. I don't know if this is answering your question. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. How do you calculate horizontal minimums and maximums without shear data? Without the shared data, no. I mean, you have to. Okay, this is the course. Minimum, you got. Uh, uh, you can get uh, the shared data from the uh, sonic, from the wheel logs, the shear wheel logs, long spacing logs. You can get from the uh, seismic, also the shear data. Um, and you confirm it with the lab work, 
uh, Poisson ratio. There's a lot of way to do it. And uh, you end up with, when you drill a well or several wells in the area, you get the leak off test. And that leak off test represent the conversion from shear velocity to pore pressure. So it's, it's, it's several ways to do it. It's not just one way. So the methodology for uh, predicting pore pressure uh, uh -huh. before drilling, how has that changed since many of our drilling functions are moving to more automation? You know, it's, this is an excellent question, but the automation, it does rely on what the input on the rig flow. And I don't know if anybody has modified their system or software to help in that field. I have no idea. That's a good question, but I don't think I have an answer. We'll define okay, the we answer have, for it. We have another question. Uh, LOT versus fracture closer, closure pressure. Which one uh -huh. do you prefer for calibrating SH min? LOT is higher than FCP, fracture closure pressure. Well, sometimes when you when you plug okay, when you do the frac, you do it from a pump. It's a different pump. Yeah. So you pressurize the you're gonna draw a rack hole. In the shape, this is in the shape, not in the sand. You can't frack the sand. That's the fracture gradient in the shape. That's why SHM uh, uh, MIN. You're going to drill a rack hole in the shape, and after the casing and everything, cementing, you're going to drill a rack hole in the cement in the shape, and you're going to pressurize the formation until the Okay, the pressure on the uh, horizontal axis and the time on the time on the horizontal axis and the pressure on the vertical axis until this relationship shape does not become linear. On the LRT, it is clear that that linear relationship does not exist anymore. So you see bent on that relationship, that linear relationship. This is where your LOT comes, where the, the formation start open up a little bit. But if you keep pumping, that curve is going to drop again because your pressure is going to dissipate in the frac system or the frac, frac shape. So LOT is, 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 is good estimate for uh, S, SHMN. I mean, it's guaranteed. Thank you. It looks like that's all the time we have for questions today. So I want to remind our listeners later today, you will receive a link to a recording of today's webinar an evaluation form, and a link to register for poor pressure, fracture pressure, and well bore stability. That's offered live online format during the mornings of November 2nd through 4th, 9th through 11th, 2020. And Dr. Shaker also teaches these additional classes for SEA. For safe drilling, formation, fracture pressure interpretations and analysis, and seal and reservoir pressures analysis for EMP prospects risk assessment. Thanks for joining us. Goodbye. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.